Coming up, I'll tell you why it may be smart to quit your job. And then it's a dumpster fire, folks. More teachers are quitting than ever before. We'll break it down. What does that mean for society and our economy? Let's go. Helping you win at work so that you can win in life. What does it mean? It simply means more money, more meaning. Because you only got one shot at this earth and this this around the, the old uh, globe, if you will. And I want you to make it count. So let's talk about quitting. We are in a truly extraordinary time of history. The last three years, or let's call it the last two and a half years, We've seen interruption, disruption to the workforce like never before. Coming out of the pandemic in 2021, we saw four plus million jobs created. And as a result, we started seeing people hop off the old merry-go-round and jump on another one. That led to a term called the Great Resignation, where astoundingly we saw record month after record month after record month to the tune of four plus million people a month leaving their jobs. That helped drive already negative environments that lead to inflation, helped drive inflation, it's helped kept it's helped keep inflation where it is because of wage pressures. People are making more money than ever before, but they're not keeping it and things are more expensive. And so We've seen just people quitting and the numbers, four plus million on into 2023, people just leaving their jobs, just constantly looking for more. We have more jobs available in this economy than we have people who are unemployed. 3.5% unemployment rate. So a lot of quitting. Quitting in the news all the time. I want to talk about quitting today maybe from a different perspective than you've ever gotten. Now, I'm I'm old school because I was raised by a guy who's old, old school. My mom and dad, my dad is is an old school, played college baseball. He was an old school guy. And my brother and I, it's just two of us, I'm the oldest. My younger brother and I always played sports. Played Like, that's what we did. When we weren't at school, we were playing a sport, whether it be on an official team or in the street. All right? We played wiffle ball in the street back in my day. You know? We played tackle football without helmets and beat the stew out of each other playing tackle football. We played sports all the time. And I'll never forget, I had a basketball hoop in my driveway growing up. It's my favorite sport to this day. I love the game of basketball. And I had a buddy over one night, uh, one evening, and um, we were playing one-on-one, and he was a year older than me, and I'm short now. You can imagine how short I was as a kid. And and I'm playing this guy, and he's probably, Will, I don't know, six inches taller than me, and yet I think I can beat him. I got high expectations. Five minutes into this game of one-on-one basketball, this guy is stealing the ball from me. I can't get around him. I can't get a shot off. I'm doing fall-away hook shots, just trying to get the ball off. He's blocking it. I'm starting to suffer mentally. We are on the verge of a mental health breakdown before we even use the term mental health. It just means you were getting your butt kicked and you were embarrassed and you were getting mad. And I was getting mad. And unbeknownst to me, my dad had walked out in the front yard, uh, I think to cut the grass or something. I don't know. I don't remember. But he's there, and he can see in the side yard, and he's watching me heat up. And I must have been acting like I was on the verge of quitting, which, let's be honest, I was. I couldn't take much more dominating suffering. And he was dominating me. And my dad yelled across at me, Hey, winners never quit. And quitters never win. You're a Coleman. And I'm, you know, like, okay, yeah, I mean, I don't even know what that means. First time I ever heard it. I think it makes sense. But he's saying, don't quit. Take it like a man. But here's the thing. It's a great little motivational tool. But you know, it's not right. Because winners do quit. Winners quit the right things at the right time 
for the right reasons. Let me say it again. Winners in life, they do quit things. But they quit the right things. They quit at the right time. And they quit at the right reason. Let's break these things down. Quit the right thing. You got to, listen, you got to make good decisions. There's no honor in continuing to suck. Well, you know what I mean? Like, where did that become an honorable thing? Well, I started this business. I put X amount of money into it, X amount of time, and it's sucking wind. It's not working. Uh, but I'm going to keep doing it. Because I've got honor. I'm not a quitter. Well, no. Smart people go, you know what? I tried. It didn't work. Let's learn something. Let's fold it. Let's not damage ourselves financially, emotionally, mentally, professionally anymore. Let's start over. So if you're in a job right now where you aren't spending most of your day using what you do best to do something you enjoy, to produce results that matter to you, I got news for you. You should be thinking about quitting. Life is too short for you to not be in your sweet spot. That spot on the bat that when it hits the ball, maximum performance. Feels effortless. Ball goes faster, farther. Let's talk about quitting at the right time. Some of you have realized right now, let's look at the quit for the right thing. We're not in a position where we are using what we do best to do what we love to produce results that matter to me. So something's off, and it's starting to weigh on us mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, all the things. But wait a second. If we don't have something to quit to, well, let's just hold off. There's no need to bungee jump. Yay! Well, it wasn't the right job. I'm going to just quit. No. Quitters, excuse me, winners, quit at the right time. They got something to quit too. They're not just quitting and going, well, I'll figure it out. Screw them. This is, that's not what winners do. Winners go, this isn't the place for me, but I'm going to find the right place and I'm going to keep doing my best and I'm going to leave when I've got something to leave too. That's what winners do. And no matter what anybody says when they leave, they're like, hey, listen, that's fine. I'm, I'm moving forward in life. I'm not interested in wallowing in my past failures. I've learned something. I see a better opportunity, and I'm going to go there, and I'm not going to have any guilt. I'm going to go win. I don't care what you think. Third thing, you got to quit for the right reason. You are moving on because it's better for you and your life and those that are in your life. I get this question all the time on the show. Ken, I, I know I'm not supposed to be where I am. I've got another opportunity, but I'm dealing with guilt. Why? Why? If you're quitting for the right reason, and I always walk them through this right here, are, are you quitting out of bitterness and frustration? No, but I this isn't the right place for me, and I, I don't want to get frustrated. I've been frustrated, but I'm, I'm actually quitting, Ken, to something better. Okay, good. Are you stealing any money when you quit? No. Are you breaking any laws when you quit? No. So winners quit the right thing at the right time for the right reason. They are quitting to win. Maybe it's time for some of you to quit to win. Do you know what you were born to do? In order to get hired at a job you love, you need to get clear on your talent, passion, and mission. That's why our team created the Career Clarity Guide. In just a few minutes, this free tool will walk you through a process to discover what you do best, that's your talent, the work you love to do, that's your passion, and the results that matter to you, your mission. Then you'll feel more confident throughout the job search process. To get started, go to kencoleman.com slash clarity. All right, folks, welcome back. I am of the people, by the people, for the people. I am a man of the people. I want you to live the life that you desire to live. And I'm going to help you do that by getting in the right professional role so that you can climb to that dream job, which is spending most of your day doing things you do well, doing things you love, producing results that matter. 
um, and so that you're making more money. So the meaning and money is what we're after here. And if you're joining the show and you're watching on YouTube, watching the video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, you can share, share something if it works for you. It's a one click share it. That helps us grow. If you're uh, listening via your favorite podcast platform, uh, give us a follow and a five star review. Also, uh, the Get Clear assessment is flying off the shelf. 20 minute assessment that measures three threads, three elements that every human has talent, what you do best, passion, work you love, and mission results that matter to you. It gives you a very clear, detailed report on all three of those areas where you're above average where you are below average, and then also puts your top results in a purpose statement that become a North Star for you. The perfect job description, not perfect, I shouldn't say that, but the dream job description where you're enjoying your day. So check it out, kencoleman.com slash assessment. Okay, two education headlines for you. And this is a part of the system that has failed so many and is still failing. Now, when I say that, I am not talking about teachers. Teachers on the front lines, more on that in a moment. But the teachers, administrators that are stuck in the system, they're not the problem. But first, this headline, more colleges set to close. I've I've talked about this before on the show. Um, We are seeing a pruning going on in higher education in America. I told you it was coming. It's now happening. For years, I've been saying you're going to see more and more colleges and universities close their doors. Well, now it's happening. But who are they? They are the smaller private colleges. Now, this is a result of two things that have that have begun to take place, two patterns, trends coming out of the pandemic. One is fewer students signing up for college. And as a result, these colleges have less tuition revenue. So less students means less tuition, which means they can't make payroll. They can't justify keeping the college open. A number have closed down. Now, the number of colleges closing down in the past 10 years has quadrupled compared with the previous decade. So this is a trend that is not just pandemic related. But um, it's not just that there are less students going to college. It's also that students are picking other options, like Bethel Tech. Why in the world would you go get a four-year degree in computer science? It could cost you well over, I mean, well into the six figures. Or you can go to BethelTech.net, you get the Ken Coleman discount, and you go for fifteen grand, and nine months later, you're making seventy-five or higher. We've got nearly a hundred students taking Bethel Tech's online program right now. What? Why would you go to college for that? So that is affecting. Now, let me tell you who's not being affected by this. Um, the highbrow, high-brand schools like Ivy League schools and schools that have the same kind of Ivy League status, I think Stanford, Duke, Vanderbilt, you know, they've got a very – High academic status. They're not Ivy League technically, but those kind of schools are thriving. This is a quote from Hafiz Lakani, founder and president of Lakani Coaching. For brand name colleges, the demand is off the charts. It's never been harder to get in, so more demand. Private colleges that are less prestigious but equally expensive are struggling. So everybody kind of jumped in on the let's raise tuition game, but people are backing off, and the only schools that are thriving as tuition continues to skyrocket are your higher brand name private schools. Tuition and fees plus room and board for four-year private college average, are you ready for this? $53,000 in the 2022-2023 school year. At four-year in-state public colleges, it was $23,250. So, I've told you this is going to happen. It is happening. You're going to see more and more higher ed institutions shut their doors, cut way back, and you're going to have the few brand name. Everybody wants to, I went to Harvard. I guess that's how a Southerner would say that. 
I realized I had a deep southern tinge to that one. But, you know, it's like those are not guaranteed for success. Now, you can say, well, Ken, the data says if you go to an Ivy League school, you get a higher salary. Because, yeah, because a lot of a lot of companies are hiring people right out of the club. Folks, this is the club. Make no mistake about Ivy League schools. Can I just go ahead and blow it up for you? They're not making you smarter. I don't buy that for a second. It's all brandy. You know what it's about? It's about elitism. Everybody wants to maintain the elite status of the club. So if I went to Harvard and I'm now in a position to hire a Harvard person, I'm going to do it. Why? Because it makes me still look good. It's all marketing. It's hogwash. These campuses are so woke now, I don't know what you're learning other than to be offended. Oh, boy. Next story in the education space, a bigger problem, much bigger problem. Teachers are exiting the classroom at increased rates. More teachers than usual exited the classroom after last school year, confirming longstanding fears that pandemic-era stresses would prompt an outflow of educators. This is USA Today article. Chalkbeat did a new study across eight states, just eight, and they found the most comprehensive accounting of recent teacher teacher turnover to date. In Washington State, more teachers left the classroom after last school year than at any point in the last three decades. Maryland and Louisiana saw more teachers depart than any time in the last decade. And North Carolina saw a particularly alarming trend of more teachers leaving mid-school year. Did you hear that? This is in the middle of the school year. Those teachers are gone. I'm out. Now, because I just shared that, I got to give you this later in the article. This is from Kevin Bastian, a researcher at the University of North Carolina, where he is studying the, the teacher turnover rate in North Carolina. Listen to this. Okay? So North Carolina reported more teachers leaving in the middle of the school year. These are not deadbeat jerk teachers. These are good women and men who say, I can't do it anymore and listen to this this is a direct quote from the analysis teacher attrition can be destabilizing for schools but he found that effective teachers the good ones or the really good ones shall we say that because i don't want to disparage teachers here teachers are the victims in this environment folks let me be very clear i've talked to hundreds of them over the last two years talking about what's going on in the school system Effective teachers were particularly likely likely to leave the state's public schools last year. Mid-year increased from under 4% in prior years to over 6% in the last school year in North Carolina. Rising frustration has pushed more teachers out of the classroom. In Louisiana, the number of teachers who resigned due to dissatisfaction increase. In Hawaii, more teachers than usual identified their work environment. So let me tell you what teachers have told me. They said, Ken, number one, we aren't allowed to teach critical thinking. We are not teaching the subject. We are teaching to a standardized test. That's the first thing they tell me. Why? Because politicians got involved. And when politicians and government get involved, we go into... Political correctness, wokeness, uh, lobbyists that are influencing the teachers' union. And so they're saying, number one, Ken, we're teaching to a standardized test. Number two, helicopter parents are out of control. Can't discipline, can't give a bad grade because parents get their feelings hurt. Wake up, America. We are driving our best and brightest out of the most important jobs we have, training our future. Are you wondering if you should leave your current job or stay put? You're not alone. That's why we created the Should I Quit My Job quiz. In just five minutes or less, this quiz will help you determine if you're at the right company and if you're in the right role. If you need to make a move, you'll even get practical next steps to keep you moving forward. Listen, stuck is a choice, and life is too short not to do what you were created to do. To take the quiz, go to kencoleman.com slash quiz.
All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. All right, here's a question. Weigh in on the comments. Can money buy happiness? What say you? What say you in the booth? I've got Will Rudder in on the engineer board today going, eh. Uh, Alex knows too much. He knows the article. Nathan, can money buy happiness? What say you? Nathan says, no. Christian is working on the calls over there. I'm going to guess that he would say no. Uh, we have some people in the lobby saying money cannot buy happiness. Okay, so there you go. This is a very quick uh, thing. All right. Well, the answer is it can buy some happiness. Some. Operating word, some. Let me explain. Two prominent researchers, Daniel Kahneman and Matthew Killingsworth, came to this conclusion that for most people in the United States, the answer is seemingly yes, it can buy happiness. I'm using the word some. Now, this is a study that was just published in April uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, overturning research that has been pretty dominant since 2010 that said, People are generally happier as they earn more, but the joy levels out when their income hits $75,000. Now, I've actually reported that data on the show before, and I've heard that. Well, that finding was posted originally by Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel Prize-winning economist and psychologist in 2010, that our emotional well-being rises with income but there is no further progress beyond an annual income of 75000 So essentially what they found previously was, let's say you start out making thirty five and you, you work your way up and you get to 75 your happiness grows each time you get a promotion. But once you get to 75 if you get a bump to 100 your happiness doesn't increase. Now i got to tell you, I am not the smartest tool in any shed. Okay? You people know that. I don't have a college degree. I'm proud of it. I have an overwhelming amount of common sense, though. In fact, I'd be willing to brag. I got more common sense than most people, but I'm not very intelligent. Well, I remember when that data came out, I was like, that doesn't seem right. But hey, I got to take my shoes off to count. What do I know? Right? So I was like, okay, sure. Well, in 2021... Matthew Killingsworth, remember, he's one of the two that did this new study. Kahneman came out with the original data that I just talked about. Well, Killingsworth in 2021, who's a he's a happiness researcher, senior fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School, found that happiness does not plateau after 75,000. Now, that makes more sense to me. And that experienced well-being can continue to rise with income well beyond 200,000. I promise you right now. I promise you right now, if I move a bunch of you folks from 75000 to 200000 you're pretty daggum happy. I'm telling you that right now. Okay? I can tell you if I get a significant number, I'm going, I'm happy, baby. I'm happy. I didn't need any research. And by the way, you know you're happy when you say it like that. There's, I'm happy, and then there's, I'm happy. You know, it's from the soul. All right. So, guess what happens? This is really great. So, Kahneman and Killingsworth get together, and they called this latest study. And by the way, this is such a cool thing. The study, they said, was an adversarial collaboration. I'm slow clapping for two people that have different views getting together and and they're going to test their findings against each other's findings. Adversarial collaboration. Very cool. So what did they find? The study reached two big conclusions. Number one, happiness continues to rise with income, even in a high range of incomes, for the majority of people. Showing that for many of us, on average, having more money can make us increasingly happier. Well, of course, if I make half a million dollars, one year, and the next year I make eight hundred thousand. I promise you, I'm happy, and I'm I'm doing something with my happiness, right? 
I mean, come on. This is not this is not like groundbreaking information. Give a person three hundred thousand dollar raise, I promise you they're happy. The study also found, though, that there was an unhappy minority, about 20% of participants whose unhappiness diminishes with rising income up to a threshold and then shows no further progress. Now, here's why. Those people tend to experience negative miseries that cannot be alleviated by earning more money. Examples as heartbreak, bereavement, or clinical depression. So it is also absolutely understandable that if a guy goes from making half a million to 800000 but he goes through a painful divorce during that same time, he's not happy. There's where the money doesn't make up a difference. Okay? So I'll pay this off for us in just a moment. In the simplest terms, Killingsworth says, this suggests that for most people, larger incomes are associated with greater happiness. Well, of course. The exception is people who are financially well-off but unhappy. For instance, if you're rich and miserable, more money won't help. For everyone else, more money was associated with higher happiness. Why? Well, the more money I have, if I'm not miserable in other areas of my life, I have more freedom. See, money equates to more freedom. The more money I have, the more freedom I have. Think about that. When Thomas Jefferson, who was influenced by the great thinker John Locke, writes in the Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he's talking about essentially the same thing. He says, life, you have the right to live. No one take your life. He then says, liberty, which is obviously speaking directly to freedom, and then he says, the pursuit of happiness. And so I'm a speaker, I'm a writer, and sometimes we speakers and writers will say something and kind of repeat it, and it's the same thought. And Jefferson was saying, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And what he's talking about is freedom. So the more money you have, the more freedom you have. If you understand that, then you get it. Now here's the difference. If I'm not mentally healthy, so I've got tons of stress, worry, maybe I'm dealing with mental illness, If I'm not relationally happy, meaning my marriage isn't strong, my relationships with friends aren't strong, I'm lonely. If I'm not occupationally happy, I'm spending the majority of my life in a job where I may not be good at it, I don't enjoy it, they don't appreciate me, then guess what? No amount of money will fix those issues. Mental, emotional, relational occupational health. And so money and more money is more freedom unless you're prisoned to relationship issues, health issues. Listen, if you're suffering physically, an amount of money is going to make you happy. You're not going to fix that. You're dealing with suffering. If you're if you're not happy in your marriage, money's not going to help. You're suffering. If you're, not, if you're not happy in your job, they could throw a raise at you. I promise you, you will get over it because you are suffering. So when we see studies like this, understand that if I'm healthy in those three areas, then more money gives me more options, thus more freedom. The more freedom I have, the happier I am. So remember this. It's not about the dollars in the bank account. It is about the freedom that the money represents. That's why at Ramsey Solutions, we talk about financial peace. I have peace. I'm not worried. I'm not stressed. I'm free. And so understand, if your life is suffering, there is no amount of money that will fix it. But if you're healthy, then the money makes you happy. And I'm all for that, baby. Right? So, have a perspective of what money does for us. More money means more options and more freedom. Did you know that recruiters take an average of six seconds to scan a resume? And that's if they ever see it in the first place. 
In fact, 75% of resumes are rejected before reaching a hiring manager. Listen, folks, if you want to get hired, you've got to make your resume worth noticing. That's why we created How to Write the Perfect Resume. This free guide will walk you through the five steps to stand out in the hiring process to get you your dream job. If you want to get started, go to kencoleman.com slash resume. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. It's time to coach some people up. Let's go to Steve, who joins us now in Ventura, California. Steve, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey there, Ken. Thank you so much for taking my call. You bet, Steve. What's up? Well, um, here's kind of a brief overview of what's going on. So um, I'm a mortgage loan officer, and I'm really passionate about what I do. Um, I really love what I do, and I feel that it brings out the best in me and really uses my kind of talents and abilities, so to speak challenge that I have, mortgage industry has been kind of in a down cycle for a while. Um, my career choice at the moment really isn't paying the bills um, with my family, and it's missing the mark by a pretty big margin. So really, my question for you is this. How do I reconcile having a job that I really love and feel like it's a match for me, but really isn't paying the bills? Yeah, you got to go find another job that is a match for you that does pay the bills. Aren't you glad you called for that <laughs> unbelievable advice? That's uh I know, folks. Life changing. It's perfect. I know. I'm. I'm. Uh, you know. I'm. I'm self-proclaimed genius, but in Love my it. in my simplistic answer, that really is the case. So what we have to do there is we break that simple statement down. What Excellent. do you okay. love about being a mortgage loan officer? Give me. Give me some real reasons. What do you love about it? So a couple of things. Um, I really love working with people. Yep. So that's a big part of um, where I'm at. And mortgages, um, as you probably know, it takes 30 days to close a loan. So I'm working with people for a good period of time, building trust, building relationships. Um, and it really is kind of like project management as well to make sure everything gets closed on time. Yep. Um, I love the networking piece behind it, kind of a little bit of a face in the community, so to speak. Uh, but really when it comes down to it, it's that people component of yeah. it. Yeah. All right. So we know what you love about it. You love walking with people on a very important purchase of their life. We're talking about their home. And you like walking with them. You also mentioned it's like a project management role. Do you love project management? Yes. Well, I got to tell you, my friend, I would be moving into project management or something similar to that that has a high people quotient to it, meaning Mm -hmm. you're not stuck in systems all day long and never seeing people, but you are moving the ball down the field as a result of being that hub or that the, the center of the spoke of the bike. You know what I'm talking about? So that, that yeah. you are in the middle or you are moving around, that's going to give you that high level of of touch of people and interacting with people, okay? And, and then yeah. it's going to allow you to feed that desire to move the ball from A to Z. And so people and projects. I want to make sure the projects get done the right way on time, and I want to be dealing with all of the key people and I'm a part of that people side of things that helps move the project through. It's the communicating. Yes. It's the connecting, cheering people yes. on. That's your jam. And so I think you and I just walked through a high-level job description, and I think you're looking at that and you're going, I've got a lot of great experience as a mortgage officer, and yes. uh, I'm going to go look for – and we, we don't have to look specifically for project management positions, but I'm saying – they need to have that element of you're a guy who likes execution and efficiency, but you want to be yeah. with people all the way through. You don't want to be left alone just to deal with spreadsheets. So that's what you're looking for. And how can you do that? Where can you do that? That's what you're looking for. So I would say, let's go. You can always come back to the mortgage industry if it heats back up. That's very mm-hmm. normal. Those industries staff down and staff up depending on how hot it is. So in the meantime, yeah. though, I think you're diversifying your professional life and saying, you know what? I don't have to be stuck in the mortgage industry. I can go do project management work or be in leadership or management and lead people, serve people. I can be a customer service uh, supervisor and lead a team. 
that are serving customers. I think you have so much on your resume that's applicable. I would just be looking for those type of jobs everywhere in Ventura. And you've got the experience. Make sure you got the connections. And then we go for it. But, yeah, don't keep suffering because there's no need <laughs> yeah. to suffer. It's time for you to thrive. You've done your time. The industry is the industry right now. So go do something else. And you know exactly what you love to do and why. We just talked about it. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Giddy up. Giddy up, man. I mean, look, this is all about taking control of your future. Go. Now. You know what you're looking for. You know how you're qualified. So hang on the line. Let's give him... uh, Let's give them the get clear assessment as well as the proximity principle. I think that's the book he needs. Start making connections to do the work he wants to do. According to Glassdoor, the average job offer attracts over 250 applicants. If you've made it to the interview, you've already made a great impression. So now is the time to showcase how you are the best choice for the role. That's why we created How to Win the Interview. This free guide will walk you through the five strategies to help you stand out amongst the competition. With just some intentionality, you can prepare yourself to win the interview. Go to kencoleman.com slash interview. All right, folks, welcome back to the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, uh, we have just had a tremendous, tremendous time in Kansas City and Chicago at our career breakthrough event. This is for people who feel like you're just not where you want to be. There's a gap between where you are and where you want to be financially and professionally because those two are connected. You've been overlooked. You've been passed over. Uh, Maybe you're in a really crappy environment and you see no future there. Some of you just, I don't know what I want to choose, Ken. I'm, I'm in a transition, but I don't know where to transition and how to transition. Or I know where I want to go, but I don't know how to get there. If this event is for you. It's a career breakthrough event. I'll be speaking on the formula to get breakthrough so that you can walk forward confidently. I'll be taking your questions live in the crowd. Career breakthrough, Chicago, is that right? No, 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 Atlanta. Sorry, Atlanta, Georgia, May 18th. Dallas, Texas, May 23rd. That's Atlanta, Georgia, May 18th. Dallas, Texas, May 23rd. I just got done with Chicago, folks. I'm, my brain is fried. I need a break, and uh, I'll get there. But it's going to be fun. These events are so much fun. Tickets start at 50 bucks. Go to KenColeman.com slash events. KenColeman.com slash events. All right, let's go to Chris in St. Augustine, Florida. I believe one of the oldest cities in America. Chris, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hey, Ken. Good afternoon, sir, and thank you so much for taking my call. I really appreciate it. You bet. It. What's up? Hey, so I'm uh, I'm in uh, the preparation phase of uh, retiring from the military here. Um, I, I enlisted uh, in my early 20s, and uh, so I worked a few odd jobs prior to um, my service. Uh, but really, my my active duty time is is the only thing I know career wise. And I'm, what I'm trying to figure out uh, and determine is how my skills uh, from the military will and can transition to the civilian sector. Yeah. What are the top um, skills that you bring with you from the military? I want to write these out because we're going to go over this. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. So obviously a, a, a knack for leadership. Okay. Um, uh, I'm degreed. Uh, I have two healthcare administration. Well, I have a healthcare administration degree as well as a, an MBA. Um, but healthcare in the military is, is significantly different than healthcare in the civilian sector. How? Um, uh, just the, the structure, uh, the, the, a lot of the policies that we, uh, abide by, um, civilian, uh, healthcare entities don't necessarily abide by. I think uh, two commonalities would probably be logistics, uh, and maybe, um, maybe just personnel from a personnel HR standpoint, possibly. Yeah. But let me ask you uh, this while yes, the sir. way they operate is different, you're still leading Correct. people. Correct. And so the rhythms, the policies may be different, but at the end of the day, you're still providing health care in the military, and you are leading people who provide health care. Correct. Okay. So, so couldn't you make the statement, or can I make the statement, that you could, in fact, lead people in health care in the private sector? 
Sure. If you understood the way things are supposed to happen and how and why. Sure. That'd be valid. Okay. What what other sure. skills besides leadership though? Because we immediately went into these degrees you have and the sure. MBA. I mean, that's great too. I love that you got leadership skills. What other skills and experience? If I'm sitting with you and I'm going, hey, tell them, Chris, tell them what you're really good at doing, what you really love sure. doing. What are you, you going to tell them? Sure. So I did a few years of uh, talent acquisition. So HR, Great. HR uh, recruiting type of uh, type of work. Uh, and I was also, uh, for a few years, I did um, plans, operations, and logistics uh, for, uh, for both personnel and equipment uh, for the, the healthcare side of, of the military. Okay, so uh, when you say logistics, is that like uh, purchasing? More, more so the movement of, okay. of equipment and All personnel right, from point A to so point B. So that's very process driven. So there are four types of work. I could take the entire world of work, every job in the world, and put it into four categories. This is kind of the methodology underneath my assessment. But there's four okay. areas of work. One, people work. Okay. Two, idea work. Three, process work. Four, things work, right? So things being I'm working with my hands, I'm fixing, I'm building, I'm designing. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. All right. So of those four types of work, people work, idea work, process work, things work. And I don't mind if you got two. Where would you put yourself in that in that four those four quadrants? Where where are your greatest talents? People work, process work, idea work, things. Definitely, definitely people. Definitely sure. people. I agree. Yes, sir. And then what would you say? So that's what you're good at. What do, What would you say mm-hmm. you enjoy most of those four? Ooh. People Definitely work? people. Yeah. Definitely okay. people. All right. So people and people. All right. So while you've got some process experience and you mm-hmm. clearly have some process skill, you don't want to spend most of your time doing a bunch of process work. You want to be doing people work. Okay because you're good with people and you can pull in some of the process stuff, but it's because you're good with people making sure that things get done. So I love the leadership side of things and the administration side. So if I were you, I would be looking at HR leadership roles. I would be looking at healthcare leadership roles just, and I'm not limited to those two areas. Sure. But if I'm sitting at your, at your kitchen table, that's what we're starting with. Okay. Because you have very relevant experience. Military healthcare administration qualifies you to be in healthcare in the private sector. Do you have to learn some new language, some new policies, you know, all that kind of stuff? Sure. But come on, man. Sure. The military is arguably the greatest organization, the U.S. military, one of the arguably the greatest organization in the world, the way you guys run, the way you're trained. So I think you're very qualified. And so I would be looking okay. at healthcare leadership positions, private. And I would be looking at HR as well, because again, you recruited, okay. you know, sure. so you've got a lot of transferable skills. That's my okay. take. How does that feel? Tell me if I'm Absolutely. wrong. No, sounds good. Sounds but let good. me yeah. also say sure. that you're not limited to an industry. I just gave you two ideas mm-hmm. based on your experience. But as I said, you're not limited to HR. You're not limited to healthcare. Look, man. If you want to go lead a small business, and let's say there's a job available in St. Augustine, and they need somebody to come run a small business, and you're going to run a team of 40 people in a manufacturing business, if you're dealing with people all day long, I think you could do that and do it well. Okay. Right? Yes, sir. Because you know yes, how to set goals and how to achieve, an, achieve a mission. You've been taught that. So every major initiative inside of a business is about a mission just as it is on the battlefield, just as it is in supporting battle operations or logistics. Am I right? Yes, accurate. Well, I don't know that I don't know that anybody's got a leg up on you when it comes to that. Okay. All right? All right, sounds good. Yeah, Thank now you, listen, uh, I'm going to do you another favor. I want yes, you to sir. take my Get Clear assessment. Are you familiar with it? Uh, vaguely. I've heard you talk about it before. I'm yes, going to give it to you. It's the least I can do for someone who has served our country. Thank you for your service. You're a great American. And I'm going to give you the Get Clear assessment, and I want you to take it. Will you promise me you'll take it? It's only 20 minutes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it's going to create a job description for you at a high level, and it's going to verify a lot of things, clarify some direction, and I think it's going to be a wonderful tool. And I'm also going to give you my book. I'm going to give you both my books, From Paycheck to Purpose and then The Proximity Principle. 
Because I talk to so many men and women in the military who feel like they can't transfer their skill and experience, and that's not true. So I want you to leverage your connections. The proximity principle is a deep dive on how to do that. And then from paycheck to purpose gives you a nice map. So all of those are my gift to you, my friend. Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you for for standing up for our country, for standing up for me, my family, and serving us well. And I got to tell you, this is a a, a call out to those of you in our audience, YouTube, radio, podcast, Sirius XM. If you know friends or family members are struggling with that transition from military to the marketplace, I have I have taught a lot on this. I want to help them. I did an entire town hall special on Fox Business a year ago on this very issue. I'm deeply committed to helping the men and women who have served us in the military understand that they have so much to offer in the private sector. Tell them about my show. Tell them to call. I'll give them free stuff if they call. But I want to coach them up. And I and listen, I'll I'll I'll, I'll move every other call out of the way for our men and women in the military. We'll get to them first. Because they have served us, they have put their lives at risk, or the chance of putting their lives at risk, all for duty and honor. And I want to honor them. They have so much to give. Love you folks in our military. Believe that you have so much more to offer. This is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on. Thanks for listening to the Ken Coleman Show. For more, you can find the show on demand wherever you listen to podcasts and watch the show on YouTube. You can also find Ken across all social media by following at Ken Coleman.